Jim. I wanted to uh, give an introduction to what we're going to be talking about, which is gut health beverages. Um, and I want to give a first a little overview, a little history of functional beverages uh, as a whole. And hopefully this will work. So the history of food, let's start from the beginning. We started by looking at food as a survival mechanism by caloric intake. We went to developing food as a form formation for a family, to create satiety, um, and basically it's all about taste and togetherness. And what we've moved towards is this area of functionality, of looking at foods to enhance our lifestyle, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. But in the future, just to give an eye out to what's around the corner, we can look at food as an optimization of our life with things like nutrigenomics. And if you haven't heard of that, keep an eye on the future. What I call malnutrition of affluence, it's the fact that as we've become more affluent as a society, we're actually less nutritious. It used to be the uh, parody of a wealthy individual was a very heavy set guy, if you remember Monopoly money. And the interesting thing is that our diet initially was one that was calorie rich and nutrient rich. And we had such biodiversity in our diet. We ate from so many species of plants. And we also got a significant amount of exercise. But over time, and particularly in post-industrial society, what we've done is we've moved to a diet that's very high in calories, but in fact is very poor in nutrients. We have a lack of biodiversity in the diet. And of course, as you know, we all get less exercise than we'd like to. So the state of our food right now is this processed foods, because it's all about the food delivery system. It's about getting food to the table. We're, we're the bread basket of the world. And so in order to do that, we have to create production, which is processed foods. And what we're doing, and what we have done, is depleted the nutrients that are normally found in foods. So the quality and the diversity is gone. Post-industrial agricultural and food processing has essentially stripped out these phytonutrients that we never knew were important to us. But you hear about polyphenols, and you hear of these antioxidants, all these things that we never knew about, but now we do. And we realize that these things have been taken out or selectively bred out of our foods because they don't taste good. We used to eat from hundreds of plants. And essentially now most Americans eat three vegetables, french fries, ketchup, and iceberg lettuce. And that's a fact. So studies are showing now that this relationship between what we eat in our Western diet and chronic disease is more profound than ever. And what we've done is we've supplanted our food quality concerns with consequences in the quality of our diet. So processed foods, again, when you look at the facts, 90% of the money that Americans are paying for food is going into processed foods. 10,000 new processed food products are introduced every year in the United States. And these contain lower levels of antioxidants and other phytonutrients, which are very important for us. So this leads us right into this area of functional foods. And functional foods as a general category is, is hitting on the sweet spot of what we're going to be talking about today, which is gut health. But bear with me one more minute. What's happened is people are recognizing the deficiencies that we're having, and they're recognizing that they can take an active role in managing their health through their diet. And so what's happened now between the knowledge that we have in food science and our ability to uh, make changes, it's leading us into this new era of functional foods. So you may say, well, what are functional foods? And everybody asks that question, and everybody's looking for a very specific answer. And I'm going to give you a general one. I'm going to say that there's three general types of functional foods. There's those that are inherently healthy. And I use the example here of uh, grape juice. So an inherently healthy functional food product is one that is made from or contains a natural bioactive ingredient, such as grapes, because they have polyphenols and, and other benefits. The next class of functional foods are these bioactive added. And those are a naturally healthy product, per se, but one that is um, enriched or enhanced with a bioactive ingredient for a specific health function. And where the market has actually been going is these more engineered products. And I use Red Bull as an example because 
It is formulated specifically to achieve a functional benefit. So that is, in fact, a functional food. And when you look at the spectrum of functional foods, and again here I'm focusing on beverages, on the one end where you can say it's definitively a food product, to the other end where it's more medicinal, there's a whole host of products. The nutritious products, the enriched, the enhanced, the engineered, those that are designed for wellness, and those that are designed for functional or semi-therapeutic benefit. So now this leads us into the gut health market, which is where we want to focus today. 70 million adults suffer from digestive problems in America alone. You see these commercials all the time for the therapeutics on the marketplace. It is an epidemic. And it's an epidemic partly because of what we spoke about earlier, which is this processed foods and the way that we're living our lifestyles. One in seven people will suffer a chronic gastrointestinal disorder. And 76 million people will get a foodborne illness in the U.S., and 40 million people will suffer from traveler's diarrhea. So that should indicate to you the propensity for this type of gut health problem. Well, why probiotics? Why are probiotics one of the key things that we've heard about and why is it doing so well? Well, it represents one of the fastest growing sectors in functional foods. Um, the global volume of consumption is three times greater than omega-3, which you probably are, are, hear of all the time. It is really the most successful functional ingredient on the marketplace. The global market is estimated at about $28 billion, and it's expected to reach about $45 billion, and it is continuing to grow at a very high rate. Probiotic supplements, they only account for about 6% of the supplement sales in the marketplace, but it's $2.3 billion, and it outstrips soy, which has been around a while and was one of the keynote products uh, in the supplement marketplace. In the U.S., per capita spending on probiotic supplements is expected to double very soon. But the lion's share of probiotic sales is really occurring in the food sector, and specifically in beverages. Um, sales of probiotic-containing foods grew 31.5%. And it's continuing at a very fast pace. North America alone has seen tremendous growth. And to give you an indication, this kind of breaks out some of the key food sectors that are uh, leading with probiotics. And you can see that, obviously, baby products are very key among them, which should tell you something about how people are viewing probiotics as a very safe, efficacious, um, and something that is being ingrained in society. And, of course, beverages, 28%. So consumer interest in probiotics is measured by Google, which, interestingly enough, uh, I heard on NPR this morning, um, an analyst, somebody just wrote in a, written a book about analytics and how they're being used. Um, Google can give you real-time information about trends in the marketplace. So it's multiplied by a factor of three since 2004. The term probiotics grew in awareness just between 2002 and 2009, which is prior to getting to a large state, by 567%. So again, it should give you an indication that probiotics is a very solid and, and high growth segment. 81% of Americans ranked probiotics as the most important nutrient in a 2011 IFIC survey. And 57% of shoppers say they want to learn more about it. So let's take a quick look at probiotic beverages and some examples, and then I'm going to lead you right into Mike Bush, who will talk to you about formulatory issues and, and some of the probiotic specifics. One of the early entrants into the world of probiotic beverages was a product called Yakult. It was launched about 75 years ago in Japan, and they would have these door-to-door -door salesmen, actually they were women, who would go around selling these, what they called the daily shots. And... Um, it's a cultured probiotic product in a very small container. It has just recently been proliferating here in the United States, which is one of the last countries uh, to, uh, to see Yakul come into the marketplace. Um, and they sell over 52 million bottles a year in the U.S. already, and they really have only been in the marketplace a couple years. And they use a proprietary strain of probiotic, which was developed by their founder. 
Another very interesting case is a product called Proviva, which uses the Probi product, which is a phenomenal and well-researched probiotic. This product has done exceptionally well. I think it's only two key European markets, and it was doing about $50 million in sales, which is pretty astronomical. It was launched in 94. Um, it uses the LP299B, and uh, Danone has acquired a, an equity interest in the company, uh, which should tell you about where that's going. In the U.S., after seeing the success of Proviva, a company called Next Food developed Good Belly. And Good Belly is, again, it's a um, fruit-flavored beverage. This is done in more of a shot version than the larger containers. Um, it was launched in 2006. It uses the same Proby strain, the 299V. And it also includes vitamins. It delivers about 20 billion CFU colony forming units per serving. Here's another, an example of another format besides a, a cultured milk based product, besides a fruit based beverage. This is a powdered stick pack called Pre. Uh, it essentially has um, a, a blend of several different strains of probiotics, 2.5 billion CFU per serving. It is, delivers 20 calories per stick pack. It's essentially a fruit flavoring. Um, and it also contains a prebiotic which, in the form of inulin. This is the product that uh, we have done test marketing in for the past few years. It's called Mojo Milk. It is a stick pack as well. It is, um, we looked at the marketplace and we said, gee, we, we want kids to drink healthier. Milk is essentially uh, uh, arguably a very good beverage in the form of delivering a lot of, uh, of nutrients. But kids only like milk if they put all the sugar in it. How can we make a better milk? And it took years to be able to find a strain that we felt comfortable would, uh, would remain stable in a liquid form that would remain stable on the shelf. We used the Ganadin BC30. Um, we put uh, 2 billion CFU per serving. It is a, a all-natural, um, low-calorie-based powdered milk mix. Kavita is another brand. This is an RTD, and this is really a sparkling beverage. This uses also the Ganadin BC30. Um, they use several other strains as well, so they do a blended, uh, blended strain. It, again, 20 calories per serving here, and they're delivering 4 billion CFU. So what I'm trying to give you is kind of an overview of some of the beverages that have hit the market in various forms. And now I want to talk just briefly about some of the keys to being successful, what you need to be able to look at in order to um, compete in the marketplace. One of the most important things, and I call this the four keys. Number one, it has to be an experiential product. It has to deliver on taste, perception. It has to be able to have an experience of some sort. Second, it has to be safe. So you have to mitigate risk. You have to use science and a, a well-validated strain. It must also be intuitive, recognizable. It can't be something so bizarre or unusual that you're changing behaviors because people don't do that very easily. And finally, again, it must be endorsed or validated by key stakeholders. One thing that's very important is that I've seen a lot of functional food products, a lot of functional beverages, and in fact some probiotics who try and be a therapeutic. And I will tell you that the most success, successful functional products provide a wellness benefit. They're not trying to masquerade as a therapeutic. Don't go there. Consumers don't want to eat from their medicine cabinets. They want to rely on science for a validation, not as the primary selling point. For serious health conditions, remember, consumers have options that are therapeutic, that are reimbursed by insurance. Consumers need drugs, but they want foods. It has to deliver on the food benefits of taste and convenience and let the selling proposition secondarily be that it's healthy for you. Again, consumers eat to enjoy. Everything else is secondary. And if you, if you get away from that and you're dealing with any type of functional product, any kind of gut health beverage, you're going to be off base. Deliver a lifestyle solution, not a medicine. Most of the successes in this category have created new sub-segments. 
They also have built new brands, interestingly enough, and not necessarily line extensions from major companies. And there have been many major food companies who have tried and endeavored to get into functional foods and beverages, and they failed. You, in order to be successful, you'll find that these, uh, the successful products provide a high level of convenience. And bottom line is taste. With that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to hand this off to Mike Bush, who will give you some insights into the, uh, the probiotics themselves.